Welcome back. Now we're going to be talking vaccines and of course COVID-19 is still a huge factor and a <laughs> determining sort of factor for just the way the world still functions. And we are joined now by uh, an expert in this field who has continued to do great work, uh, Dr. Alero Roberts. Thanks a lot for joining us. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Okay. I want to start as quickly as you can. Let us understand the state of vaccines with regards to Nigeria now. Because I know the latest statistics I saw said something around under 2% fully vaccinated in the country. Um, how many more vaccines are we expecting to start with? And what is the rollout looking like as quickly as you can? Well, we're expecting any number that we can get. The truth of the matter is that we are part of the COVAX um, initiative. So we'll get whatever you know, is available. The, the problem is more a case of production globally and then getting our quota. But everything that we've asked for so far, we've, we, we're getting, I think there's another 30 million coming in. And certainly by 2022 next year, we should be able to vaccinate at least a quarter of the population, give them, giving them double, giving them, you know, fu fully vaccinated, that is. As to the rollout, it has been extremely efficient, given everything that's going on in the country, and you know what I'm talking about. But this, this has been extremely efficient, and we have been able to leverage very strongly on our experience with the polio vaccination. So, you know, so far, very good. That's the best I can say. Okay, I mean, we're trying to stay very optimistic here because, I mean, I think I haven't heard uh, something about the U.S. President Biden uh, trying to also ship out 500 million vaccines to the rest of the, the rest world. Of oh, the he better. America, America is overstocked. <laughs> America <laughs> is overstocked and America is the, going to be the receiving on the receiving end of unvaccinated immigrants if yes. they don't if they ship don't do out that. what they are hoarding very, very but, quickly but, and make sure that the rest of the world can get vaccinated. No one is safe until everyone is safe. Very true. What is, what is Nigeria's biggest issue? Is it the lack of availability or is there a lot of hesitancy? Well, hesitancy is very difficult to judge in a situation where there's, you know, very little, where the availability is, is short. So far, I mean, there are so many um, sites on the main, in the island, in Lagos State, that are, you know, f crowded day after day after day, you know. So it's very difficult to judge hesitancy with, with a shortage. Okay, speaking on to that now, because we've had certain countries have made it mandatory. Some other countries are going through these debates. Of course, the biggest example is the U.S., where there's a constant political battle now uh, with vaccines. It's become such a political conversation, I sipping know. into election conversations even. Um, but some other countries have made it mandatory. We're hearing, I think, Denmark, I can't remember, is the first country in the world now, I think, or Europe, to be fully open because they've gotten at least 75% uh, vaccination rates fully, uh, which is, of course, crosses the threshold for herd immunity. Um, I mean, we are still a long way from that. But do you think it's a good thing, considering what the world is going through, for vaccinations to be mandatory? That's actually... Ooh, I've debated that in my mind several over several days and weeks ever since I first heard about it. But, and, if, and if you recall, even during the time of the lockdowns and whatnot and whether, you know, things should be made mandatory, should people be sanctioned. I've, as a public health physician, I, I hold strong reservations towards making every, anything literally by force, you know. And except it's really for public good, should anything be made mandatory. But in our case in Nigeria, it's very difficult to say vaccines should be mandatory when you can't even provide enough for 50% of the population. So I don't think that's a question we should even be asking now. The question we should be asking now is how soon can we get 50% of our population vaccinated? I mean, those who even want it. Let's not even talk about the hesitant, talk about those who are, you know, who can't get it, who won't get it. Let's even talk about vaccinating 50% of the population, 50% of whom I know want to be vaccinated, want to be protected. But with a virus that's killed millions of people, does that qualify as public good, like you said? I mean, trying to keep the world safe. It, it does qualify, but the truth of the matter is the better thing to do is to be able to change human behavior, human perception. The danger with going down the mandatory route is that suppose one day they say, you know, something else should be made mandatory that you really don't want to do. 
everybody should have a mark on their body as a, a tattoo or everybody should have a chip inserted or everybody should have a this or a that or the other. That's the danger with the mandatory routes. So, you know, it may seem very innocuous making immunization mandatory, but there's a danger in, in, in opening that door. You know, that, that, may be, that may not be something we want to, to do. They may make it mandatory for, for, for children, you know, anybody born with an intellectual disability to be put down. How far can it go? That these are the dangers with making things mandatory. So it has to be something that's very carefully considered. It's always better to try and change human perception, change human behavior, give reasoned arguments so that you can, you know, em empower people to do the right thing or to take informed decisions. So, uh, okay, I, I want to talk on something that people have called sort of vaccine, <laughs> vaccinism, sort of drawing from racism, uh, especially with regards to the brand of vaccines that certain countries are getting. We've seen um, a lot of countries, I think there was a Nigerian artist who put out a PSA saying the Nigerian vaccine card is almost worth nothing because I think he traveled and I think at certain borders they didn't recognize it. And uh, there was also a piece I think that was titled, I'm Nigerian, I'm vaccinated, Europe won't let me in. Um, I think for the, a lot of the people who got the first batch of vaccinations, correct me if I'm wrong, in Nigeria got the AstraZeneca, I believe. I don't know what other brands we've had. I think Moderna has come in probably. And I actually was watching the Emmy, the Emmys a few days ago, and one of the hosts talked about ranking the vaccine, the vaccine brands and, you know, put them in order based on efficacy, because I think Pfizer has the highest efficacy. So is Nigeria at sort of at a disadvantage considering the kind of brands we've gotten? seeing what is happening to us? Or are we just being discriminated against because we're Nigerians, you think? I would rather say the latter than the former. I'm sorry. But then that's, I mean, to be honest with you, everything about COVID has been so highly politicized that I'm not even surprised that this is being politicized as well. And um, I remember somebody asked a question way back when, you know, which is the best COVID vaccine? And I said, the best COVID vaccine is the one you can get because ultimately it's about the person, it's about you, the individual, and whether you're protected against severe disease and hospitalization. Granted, I mean, just like in cars, I mean, everybody would want a Rolls Royce or a Mercedes, you know, but I mean, if you can get the uh, Innocent Motors and it's moving and it's getting you from A to B and the air conditioner's working, hey, I'll drive it. Makes sense. <laughs> So I know we, we had you on the show a while ago talking about, you know, COVID and, you know, I think things were pretty much at its peak the first time we, we had you on the show. What have you noticed differently now with Nigerians, sort of the way they react to this virus? Is there more sort of awareness of what it is? Or are people now a little even more careless about, you know, how they carry on with, with, with dealing with this? That's a really good question and one that has, uh, you know, needs a lot of um, thought in the sense that what I've noticed is that COVID has certainly exposed most brutally the gaps in access to health care, the gaps in service delivery, the, 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 the gaps in awareness of disease causation. So there are so many gaps that COVID has exposed in our polity, in our social economy that it's actually scary how much we have lost over the last three, four decades, you know, things that, how, how, how is it that in the 21st century, we're teaching people how to wash hands? These are questions that, that absolutely baffle me. How is it that we're teaching people the essence of a personal and environmental hygiene in the 21st century? I mean, I don't know. So I've seen, I've seen a lot of, um, I've seen a lot of gaps. I've seen a lot of families being tipped into unexpected difficulty because suddenly a loved one is ill for any reason, for any reason. And access to healthcare is punitively expensive. And th these are things that I've seen. So people, I, I, I wouldn't like to say people have become careless, but I think people have become a little fatalistic that, well, what will be, will be. God help us all. Yeah. Before we go now quickly, um, we're talking before you came on air about, you know, COVID doesn't seem like it's going to go away. And uh, we're still talking COVID and the pandemic and lockdowns and all of that. 
Um, looking at a year from now, with the way the vaccines seem to be opening up the world a little, where do you think would be September 2022? Ah, I hope we'll still be here talking. I really hope we will still be here talking. But in truth, there are a lot of... Uh, um, we, we are worried about new and emerging infections that are being... Because several things are happening. The climate change has definitely exposed areas of the earth, areas of the planet to new risks, risks that have hitherto either been dealt with and we thought we were over it and they are re-emerging or risks that we didn't even know existed. I mean, we're seeing new interfaces of humans and animals, which is what has led to the emergence of the One Health uh, concept. But, you know, these are things that we are watching with trepidation and the truth of the matter is we simply need to be ready. So a lot of the systems that need to be in place to get us ready for that. There are people ready to accept science as the leading, as the leading voice in what we do and where we go in, in how we say things. Are people ready to, act, to strengthen health systems and, and, and bring equity to health systems? These are things we really need to be thinking about and talking about. And people need to be ready. Have, have people got universal access to health? everybody across board because it doesn't matter how well placed you are in society if somebody your 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 driver staff members family member is ill you're affected and these are things we really need to strengthen up shore up and get ready for thank you very much food for thought there indeed uh, always a pleasure to have you dr alero roberts uh, thanks for your insight today thank you so much for having me